Okay. Okay, so I am going to actually start the class with last time's material which we didn't finish. And uh, before we actually start, I'm going to start with a, a tale which has a moral for computer science and uh, or computer science students rather. This is a tale of the, uh, the lion and the rabbit. Okay, the story goes as follows. So there is a rabbit that is, uh, who's supposed to be a graduate student actually, is uh, typing up a set of notes okay, in a forest and a fox comes along and the fox asks the rabbit, uh, what are you doing? Okay. So the, ra the rabbit says, I'm writing a paper on how rabbits can eat foxes. Okay. So then the fox says, uh, that's impossible, that can never happen. And then the rabbit says, let me show you and takes him into a cave. And then a short while later, the rabbit comes out, there is no sign of the fox. <laughs> and then uh, uh, the rabbit continues to do its work, a wolf comes along and then the wolf asks the rabbit saying, what are you doing? And then the rabbit says, I'm writing a paper on how uh, rabbits can eat wolves. And then the wolf says, that's rubbish, you will never publish a paper with that kind. So then the uh, fox says, I mean, the, the rabbit says, let me show you and takes the wolf into the cave. And then a short while later, the rabbit comes out, there is no sign of the wolf. Okay. And then the rabbit goes into the cave a little later and inside the cave there is a lion with a pile of bones on the side. Okay. Which are the bones of the fox and the wolf. Okay. So that's the story. Now uh, what does this got to do with anything? So the moral of the story is uh, if you're a grad student it actually doesn't matter what uh, thesis topic you pick but what matters is who's your advisor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a part two that I will relate next time, but let's continue with the class. And uh, we, uh, last time we were talking about threads, and we'll finish that discussion and then continue from that point on. Okay, so as I remember, if you remember, I introduced the notion of a thread and how it differs from a process. So threads allow you to have concurrency within a process. Okay, multiple entities called threads execute the code of a process, shares the address space, each of it has its own stack, own set of registers and whatnot. So in some sense, what you have in a traditional process is what is technically a single threaded process. And uh, you have blocking system calls. So if you make any system call do any I.O. or the process block, there is no parallelism that you can get from a uh, single threaded process. So you can also write processes as event driven systems. If any of you are programmed with uh, GUIs and so on, you may know what events mean. When you have any sort of an event, you basically uh, trap into an event handler and then you process the event and other events occur and so on. Okay? Uh, so this is a non-blocking mode of writing processes which will give you more uh, uh, efficiency than your traditional blocking single, uh, pro single threaded process, but no parallelism. Okay. And then what we have co been calling threads are essentially what we now we should think of as multi-threaded process. Each thread in this case can make blocking calls just as you had in uh, the context in the notion of a single threaded process, but you actually have parallelism because if one thread blocks, other threads can continue to make progress. Okay? So you have your more familiar blocking interface when, when you make system calls, that thread is going to block, wait for the results of the system call to be returned. It cannot make progress until the call completes and whatnot. But the process as a whole can continue to make progress because there are other threads can, that can run in the meantime. Okay? So this is going to get you parallelism. So threads retain the idea of sequential processes okay, that you had in a single threaded process with blocking system calls. Okay, similar concept that you may already be familiar with, but it adds parallelism. Okay, so that's the important part to keep in mind. Okay, and I mentioned what their threads are and we were talking about example of a web browser last time from a client perspective. You can also use threading in servers and here's an example of uh, uh, Apache web server which has threads. 
and the way we would use threads in Apache is Apache is a web server. It receives uh, HTTP requests from clients over a network, okay? and it has to process these requests and send back responses. Okay? The way you would construct a multi-threaded server is depicted in this picture. So you will have a master thread, which we'll call a dispatcher thread, that is listening for new requests to arrive over a network. Okay? Whenever a request comes in, it is going to essentially hand off that request to one of the worker threads. Okay, so you have a pool of worker threads, and uh, when a request comes in, you look for an idle worker thread, a worker thread that has, is not processing any requests at the moment, and you hand off the request to that worker thread. That worker thread is then going to go off, process that HTTP request, uh, construct a HTML response, send it back to the client, all of that is going to happen in the worker thread, and once it's processed the request, it is going to rejoin uh, that's all the queue of idling worker thread. Okay, then it's basically asking for new work from the dispatcher. So you have a dispatcher thread, and there's a queue request coming in. They may be queued up, and as you have each worker thread that becomes idle, you hand it off to the worker. Thread. So you can essentially design your server in this fashion. Okay, and there are many different design variants that we will see in a future class. One where the threads are pre-constructed, pre-allocated. So you have a pool of threads that are already uh, initiated when the system starts up and you just simply decide which thread to assign work to or you can have threads that are created on the fly as new requests come in and then the, the worker thread may be dynamically created and added to the pool or they may just be assigned for one request and so on. So there are many variants but the high level idea is you're going to have a dispatcher thread that is going to accept request from a network and hand it off to a worker thread for processing. So, you know, and, uh, so this will give you concurrency because if multiple requests arrive more or less uh, concurrently or at the same time, you can have multiple threads working on them at, in parallel as opposed to a single threaded process where you would have to keep a queue of these requests and take each request on the head of the queue, process it, all the other requests are waiting in the meantime and only after that request is done can you take the next request and so on. So in a single threaded process, you will actually uh, see more waiting time for uh, requests, but in a multi-threaded process, you can start processing them concurrently. Okay, that's the basic idea. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, so there are many issues that come up in the context of thread management, which has to do with creation or deletion of threads, synchronization, and so on. I'm not going to go into those here. Uh, what, but I, what I will talk about is this issue of how threading packages are implemented, okay, whether they're implemented at the kernel level or implemented at the user level in the form of a library. And we'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons. Okay, so we'll start with uh, kernel level threads and then we are going to, or rather, we are going to start with the user level threads and then we are going to go to kernel level threads. Okay, so yes, question. Can you give us Okay, so if you are asking the question in the context of the server, the question is, uh, if you are designing a system, how do you decide how many threads to have in the thread pool? Okay. So, it's a good question. Now, different systems may have different architectures. In certain architecture, each thread is assigned to do a certain task. Okay. The task that is assigned to it doesn't vary. Like we saw in the uh, web browser, there may be threads that are simply uh, responsible for rendering or simply responsible for parsing HTML and so on. Okay, so in this case, a thread, thread actually has a specific job or task assigned to it. Okay? Uh, what I was talking about in the server case is you just have a pool of threads and each thread can perform any task that's given to it. In this case, the task is go process this request that has come over a network. Okay? And then you can ask the question how many threads to assign uh, create when you start up. Okay, that's a question that is going to depend on what kind of server it is and what it's actually doing. So in case of Apache, we will come back to this because Apache makes several interesting design decisions. You don't pre-decide how many threads to have. Okay? The size of the pool is going to depend on the load on the server. If more requests come in, the server is or the master thread is going to see that the queues are building up. Okay, so if we have, let's say you start with three threads. That allows you concurrency of three. That means you can service three simultaneous requests. Okay? Now, if you start seeing a heavy load, 
okay, which means there are more than three active threads in the system. These other requests that are coming in will get queued up because when they come in, none of the worker threads are idle, for example. Okay. So in this case, you know, if you have a uh, server that like Apache, it will see that your queues are building up and it will dynamically increase the size of the worker thread pool. Okay. So you can say three is not enough, I'm going to start three more and my, your worker thread pool has grown. Okay, so that will start emptying the queue that's building up. Okay, and conversely, if you see that there are the queue is always empty and there are lots of idle threads that are just sitting there waiting for work, you may decide that your worker thread pool is too large. You may terminate something. Okay, this is dynamic thread man pool management. Okay, that's a very sophisticated process. Now you can go with some simple process that says, as a designer, I decide what is the maximum. A level or request rate that I want to service and based on that you can make an estimate and say okay I will start six threads that may be enough for the load I expect to see on this application okay so that's a static pool but that's up to the designer to figure out so you can have various scenarios we'll come back to all of that again when we talk about Apache and so on any other questions here okay so we'll go back to uh, user level and kernel level threads I'm going to talk about user level first and then we'll go on to kernel level. Okay. So in a user level threads package, uh, what's happened is, what's happening is all the threads are managed by the, uh, is for in the form of a user level library. Okay. And the operating system and the kernel are not aware of the presence of threads and they don't deal with threads at all. Okay. So the OS essentially sees a process. Inside the process, there's a library that is creating threads for that process. Okay? The OS doesn't actually know of the presence of the library, neither does it care about the library. So the OS is simply seeing the process as a traditional single threaded process. And the fact that there are even threads inside the process is invisible to the OS because the library doesn't interact with those. It's doing it's, uh, managing threads by itself. This is referred to as a user level threads library. You are implementing the notion of threading in user space without any uh, support from the operating system kernel. Okay, is that clear what it means? Okay, now you can ask what, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this approach. If you have user level packages for threading, it is very efficient because all thread management calls are essentially function calls to a library that's associated with the process. Okay. Function calls are very efficient okay, as opposed to as you will see in kernel level threads packages you may have to make system calls. Okay. So uh, you do not, they're efficient which means thread creation, thread deletion, switching between threads don't need system calls so it's, uh, they only need function calls to the library. Okay. Then no kernel support is needed, no kernel doesn't have to be modified to support threads. No, I mean, if you have kernel level threads packages you need uh, OS level support, you need the kernel to be modified to explicitly support threads. Here you can implement threads even if your OS doesn't provide any support for it. Okay, so threads, threading applications will run even on platforms that are not designed for threading from an OS level for example. Okay. So those are two advantages. The third advantage is there is a flexibility in scheduling threads. Because you are, all the threads are being managed by a library that's associated with an application, is the job of the library to decide how to schedule the threads within the application. Okay, so the way scheduling, CPU scheduling will work is a two level process. Your actual CPU scheduler will first pick a process to run, okay, to actually execute. And then when the process starts executing, the threads library scheduler will run and decide which of the thread actually gets to run. And you can implement whatever scheduler you want in the library that's independent of the CPU scheduling algorithm. So you have more flexibility in this case. Okay, so you can pick schedulers that are appropriate for that application. Okay, so those are advantages. Disadvantages are uh, that if one thread in this scenario blocks, if any thread, user level thread makes a system call, the entire application process is going to block. Okay, because the OS doesn't know of the presence of threads, it doesn't know that there are other threads that could be run. As soon as it sees one system call coming from the process, it assumes that the process has made a blocking call and it blocks the whole process. So other threads will not run if any thread blocks. Okay, so any blocking call blocks all threads. Okay, that's a disadvantage here. Okay. Uh, the other disadvantage is you have concurrency but no real parallelism. Okay. 
if you have two cores in this scenario, okay, your CPU scheduler can run this process only on one core because it doesn't, it's not explicitly scheduling threads within the process. It's only scheduling the process itself. So the second core cannot be used for threads of this process. Of course, if there are other processes, they can run on that second core, but threads of a process cannot run in parallel on multiple cores if you have them in the system. Okay, so you will not get true parallelism. You will get concurrency, which means that threads can switch and you can switch between threads and execute different parts of those process on a given processor. Okay, is that clear? Any questions here? Okay, so now we will, so here's just a picture that's showing exactly that. You have processes here. Okay, these uh, circular things are threads within the process. Here is your library scheduler that's managing threads. And then as you see, what the view that the OS has of this process is that it's a single threaded process from the OS's perspective because the presence of threads is hidden from the OS. OS doesn't know about that. Okay, so OS looks at this process as a single threaded process even though there may be multiple threads. See, that process has three threads, but the OS only sees one. Here are two cores, so each of these processes can get mapped to a core. And then, as I said, once you, the CPU scheduler picks one of these processes, the library scheduler has to pick one of those threads to actually run, okay, because it has to pick which thread actually gets to go next, and so on. Okay, that's user-level processes, or user-level threads, rather. Okay, kernel-level threads is exactly the opposite. So in this case, uh, there is threading support in the operating system. It's built into the OS. OS is aware of the presence of threads inside a process. Okay, so OS knows this process has seven threads and that process has eight threads. It can see those threads and it can explicitly schedule those threads. It's no longer scheduling processes. It's actually scheduling a process a thread within a process to run. Okay? And that is actually shown here. You will see that for each process, if there are two threads, there are two schedulable entities. The kernel sees both of those two threads and it has to then pick from one of these many threads which thread actually gets to go next. Not just a process, but a specifically a thread. So it's explicitly scheduling them all. It knows about the presence of threads and so on. What that also means is when a process creates additional threads or deletes those threads, it has to do the, the, uh, perform those operations through system calls because the OS has to be inward, because the OS needs to know if there's a new thread or a thread has been deleted. So all thread management functions are essentially system calls into the OS thread. Okay? Is that clear? Any questions about this? Okay. So the advantages and disadvantages are the similar. Okay. Every advantage that you saw for user level threads is a disadvantage here. And every disadvantage that you saw is going to become an advantage here. So, for example, uh, thread management more heavyweight. In user level threads, it's lightweight. You're just simply making calls into a library. Here, you're making a call into an OS, which is a more heavyweight operation. Okay, so thread management is more heavyweight. Okay, you are bound by the CPU scheduling algorithm. Okay, in the user level threads, you could pick a scheduler in the library that was independent from the CPU scheduler. You could decide how your threads get your threads get scheduled. In this case, you don't have a choice because the kernel is making scheduling decisions for threads, whatever policy is implemented in the kernel is what you are going to get for all of your threads. Right? Is that clear? Now, as far as advantages go, uh, one advantage here is you are going to get true parallelism. If you have two cores, okay, you, you have two threads, because those two threads can actually get mapped onto two cores and then both of your threads are actually running in parallel. Okay, so if you have lots of cores and lots of threads within an application, you are going to get parallelism, okay, which you did not get in user level processes. Okay, anything else you can think of? So you go back, you will see. Uh, yes, somebody had something. Okay, so the last part is uh, if one thread is going to block in kernel level threads, okay, your process as a whole is not going to block only that thread will actually be blocked because the OS knows now about the presence of threads, it can continue to schedule other threads. So for example, if this thread of this process blocks, it's going to be taken out from the run queue and going to be put on a wait queue. Okay? But this other thread is still be on the run queue and it can get scheduled. So the process can continue to make progress even if some fraction of the threads are blocked. 
That was not the case in New Zealand. That is one thread block, the whole process block. Okay, is that clear? Yes, question mark. Can you thread what? Can a thread kill other threads? Uh, threads can basically, uh, all the threads within a process have the same level of privilege level. Okay, so threads can then invoke other threads, they can terminate other threads because you cannot do this for threads of other processes. But Threads within a process, they all have the same rights. Okay, so there is no one thread that's more distinguished than the other. That's how the programmer writes the application. They all have access to the entire address fix. So in some sense, if you know, if you want to terminate other threads, you can do that as well. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay, so I'm going to talk about one more concept here, which is called a lightweight process. And then we will move on to the next topic. A okay, lightweight process essentially takes some of the good ideas from user level processes and uh, sorry, user level threads, not processes, user level uh, threads and kernel level threads and it sort of uh, merges the two. Okay, I'm best shown with a picture here, then we'll come back to this slide. So, what happens in uh, lightweight process is that you are going to allow more flexibility in how threads within a process get mapped into schedulable entities within a kernel, okay. So for example, in this thread, uh, in this uh, process, there are three threads. The way that the process has been set up is all three threads are mapped onto one, what is called a lightweight process inside a kernel, okay. In this case, you will see that there are four threads, okay. These four threads are mapped onto two lightweight processes. And here you have three threads that are mapped onto two late wide lightweight process. So in other words, what we have is a flexibility where the kernel has this notion of a lightweight process. Application processes have the notion of threads. How the threads get mapped onto lightweight processes is flexible. An application programmer can control them. Okay. So for example, you can say that for every thread in my application process, I want a lightweight process. Okay, so you have one to one mapping. Every thread gets mapped onto its own lightweight process. That is the same as a pure kernel level thread. Okay, every thread here maps onto something that the kernel can schedule. Okay, so that's a one to one mapping. You could also say all my threads get mapped onto a single lightweight process. Okay, that's the same as user level threads. All the each all the threads are getting mapped onto one entity in the kernel that the kernel is aware of. Okay? And anything in between. Okay? You can say I have 10 threads. Three of these threads get mapped onto this one lightweight process. These two threads get their own lightweight process. The remaining five are mapped onto another lightweight process. So you can control as a programmer how many lightweight processes you want and how many pro threads you have and how they get mapped onto. And the answer as to why you would do this depends on how much concurrency or parallelism you actually want in your process. If you want full parallelism, go for one-to-one -one mapping. That's going to give you the most benefit. Okay? If you don't want that much parallelism, you decide which threads need more concurrency, which ones need less, and you decide on the mapping appropriately. Okay? So there are threading packages that are going to give you this level of sophistication. They are referred to as lightweight processes. This is a system that uh, Solaris which is an operating system, Unix-like operating system that Sun came up with now and by Oracle actually came up with. Okay. Yes, question there. Is this a Polaris or a Polaris? Is this a... Yes. Okay, so the question is, is this a copy or an alias? Is neither of the two. In some sense, this is what the kernel knows, lightweight processes are what the kernel knows about this address space. Okay? And this is, the threads are simply mapped on to those lightweight processes. They are not neither a copy nor is it an alias. It's simply saying that the, the kernel is going to schedule lightweight processes onto processors. Okay? And depending on the mapping, something else has to then decide which thread is actually going to run. So here scheduling is going to be a two level decision always. Okay. The kernel CPU scheduler picks a lightweight process. Let's say this one has been chosen, so that's actually running on this core here. Okay. Now, when this lightweight process is picked, 
you basically have to see what threads are mapped onto that lightweight process. If there's only one thread map, there's no decision. That thread actually gets to run. Okay. If multiple threads are mapped onto a lightweight process, a second level scheduler will run and say which of those threads that are mapped onto that lightweight process is going to actually get to run. So you have two schedulers, one within the library, that's a library scheduler, one within the CPU. So scheduling is now a two-level process. Yeah, but you have a CPU scheduler scheduling lightweight processes, a library scheduler scheduling threads that are mapped onto whichever lightweight process is chosen. Okay. So in some sense, it is not a copy or an alias. These are just two independent abstractions. Okay, so this is what the CPU scheduler is responsible for scheduling a lightweight process. There's a mapping of threads onto lightweight processes. That's what the library scheduler is responsible for figuring. That's your question. How is it lightweight? How is it lightweight? Okay, so the, the reason it's called a lightweight process is since there may be multiple of these entities that are part of a single process. Okay? Each lightweight process from a kernel's perspective doesn't need to have all of the data structures associated with the process. Okay, lightweight processes are going to share whatever is in the process. So, for instance, again, like a thread, you can create a new lightweight process and associate with the process. Creating that lightweight process doesn't involve all the operations that you have to do to create a new process because it's sharing the address space of the of the parent process. Okay? So, in some sense, it's, it's just a different name for what we have called a kernel level thread, just to distinguish between them. Yes, question. Uh, is this map static? Is the mapping static? The mapping is actually under the control of the programmer in this case. So if you write code which allows you to change the mapping, it can change. If you make the mapping one time, whenever the thread is created, you map it to a lightweight process, the OS will not change it for you. Okay, but a uh, programmer can change it if you want. Any other question here? Okay, so lightweight processes try to balance the sort of the pros and cons. So that's something to keep in mind. It's a very specialized uh, system. Typically, unless you have very need very careful control over how threads are scheduled or not, you are not going to actually do much with lightweight processes. You may just go with user level threads, kernel level threads. Let the scheduler do its thing. Not worry too much about it. But if you need careful control, in this case, the system is allow going to allow you to do it. Okay, yes, question. Okay, question is how does this take care of the blocking system call? That's a good point. So the thing to keep in mind is uh, if a lightweight process blocks, which means a thread that was mapped onto the lightweight process blocks, all the other threads that are mapped onto that lightweight process will block as well. Okay? But if that process has another lightweight process and other threads that are mapped onto, they will continue to run. So that's the way to keep it. Any other questions here? Okay. So last thing I'm going to mention is there are many threads packages, some of which you may use in your labs. Uh, the two that are very common are POSIX threads, which is how threading is implemented in C or C++ languages. Okay. And Java threads, which is basically how Java implements its threads. Uh, they are just simply both implementations of threads in different languages. So depending on what language you pick, you may encounter these two. You may pick some other language that has its own threading support, which is completely different, but that's also fine. Now the thing to keep in mind is uh, POSIX thread, Java threads, or some other threads in whatever language you pick are what a programmer sees as to how uh, you actually write threading code using that programming language. This is completely independent from whether uh, these threading packages are implemented as user level threads, kernel level threads, or even within lightweight process. That is up to the library, the, uh, whoever implemented the threading packet. Okay, for example, you can have POSIX threads that in some systems are implemented as user level threads. In other operating system platforms, they're implemented as kernel level threads. Okay. The same code that you write using POSIX threads will run on either of those two platforms because the API is not changing. The implementation of the API is different. In one case, the implementation is using a user level threads library. In another case, the implementation uses OS level support. Okay. Same is true of Java threads. Okay. In some cases, the JVM 
may actually implement Java threads using kernel level threads that the underlying OS supports. In other cases, the JVM may implement it using a user level library, threads library. Okay? Your same Java code that you use for writing Java, uh, using Java threads is going to run on any JVM. It shouldn't matter whether the underlying system is implemented using user level or kernel level. The advantages or disadvantages will still come into play that we talked about. But your code should run as is okay, without any changes. Okay, so you have to decouple the interface and the APIs that you use to write your application from understanding how those threading systems are actually implemented on the underlying uh, runtime or the operating system. Okay, so that's a distinction to keep in mind. Okay, any other questions here? Before I move on to this, is just overflow uh, slides from last time. I'm going to move on and talk about multiprocessor and distributed scheduling. So this is really all, everything we talked about so far is actually more undergraduate level stuff that I was simply presenting as a recap for the actual discussion on scheduling, which is going to start from this point on. So we'll start with multiprocessor scheduling, and then we'll get on with uh, and discuss distributed scheduling. Okay. So we are done with uniprocessor scheduling threads and all of that. So now let's actually talk about how uh, CPU scheduling works in a multiprocessor world. Okay, so this picture here is simply going to showing you a, a typical multiprocessor system. Okay, so what you have in a multiprocessor system, this blue line here, the horizontal line is your system bus. Okay, uh, the top circles are processors or cores of your system. Okay, so you have in this case n processors. And then each processor is going to be associated with some L1 cache and some L2 cache and L3 cache, which have been put in to optimize the running of your code. Okay. Either data or instructions are cached in these L1 L2 caches. And uh, basically, whenever your process runs or thread runs, it's going to look at these caches. And if the data is in the cache, you're going to be running faster. Otherwise, you have to get the data and or instructions from main memory, which is shown at the bottom here. Main memory is shared across all the processors. Okay, this is a shared memory multiprocessor system. And uh, L1 caches and L2 caches are distinct. So in some sense, in, uh, L1 and L2 cache is distinct for each core, okay, in this case, or in each processor. Okay. This is a picture to keep in mind. Now, why am I talking about caches and so on will become clear. But the thing to keep in mind is, when you have multiple processors okay, in your system, Main memory is going to be shared by all of the CPUs and uh, caches are going to be distinct. Each caches are not shared. Any data is actually going to, in one cache is not accessible to another processor. Okay. Now with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about multiprocessor scheduling and then we'll see why whatever I just said actually makes a difference in how scheduling works. Okay. So these two pictures show two very high level overview approaches for implementing a multiprocessor CPU scheduler. The first approach uses what is called a single centralized run queue. So what happens in this is all threads or processes that are ready to run are going to be queued up here in this queue. There are multiple processors. Each process implements time slicing. Whenever the time slice on any processor ends, Okay, the CPU scheduler will run on that processor. That CPU scheduler is going to look at the queue, pick the next thread or process from the queue, and schedule it. Okay, and then that thread is going to run for its time slice. In the meantime, some time slice on another processor may end. CPU scheduler will run there. It will pick the next thread or process from the queue and run it there, and so on and so forth. Okay, when the time slice ends, if the the thread or process is still runnable, it's going to go to the end of the queue if you're doing round robin, or if it's done some IO, it may go off into a wait queue, exactly what we said in a uniprocessor world. Okay, centralized queue approach. Okay. Here's a different approach, which is called distributed queue. Okay. Uh, so in this case, you no longer have one queue, but you have n queues. Okay. In the extreme, you have one queue per processor. Here you have showed one queue for two processors, but think of a scenario where each processor or core gets its own run queue. Okay. So in this case, scheduling is going to work exactly the same way. 
except that there are multiple queues. So whenever a time slice on a processor or a core is going to end, you are going to look at your local queue. There's no global queue here. Each processor or core has been given a queue or you're sharing queues with a smaller group. So you look at your local queue, you pull a thread or process from it and you schedule it and so on. Okay, so this is, these are the two approaches. So now let's think about what are the pros and cons of these approaches and what has this got to do with whatever I showed you on the previous slide in terms of caches and what. Okay, so let's first take the first approach, that this uh, uh, centralized queue approach. Okay. What might be some disadvantages of this approach? The first disadvantage is already written there. Okay, it says the queue can be a bottleneck. The uh, question is what does that mean? Why is it a bottleneck? Sort of there. Yeah. Right. Load balancing is not a bottleneck there, but I mean, uh, but what you said sort of is uh, what is the case here. So, since it's a centralized queue, okay, and then there are multiple uh, CPUs or core sharing that queue, you would realize that this run queue is a shared data structure. Okay. If it's a shared data structure, it needs to be locked. Okay. If two cores become idle at the same time, okay. That both this, the CPU scheduler that's running on each of those core can't go simultaneously and start taking out uh, processes from the queue. That's going to cause inconsistency. So you have to, as as you uh, probably know, as in any threading system, whenever you're sharing data structure, you have to protect it by a lock for consistency. Okay. So what that means is the CPU scheduler, whenever it runs, first it has to acquire a lock. And only after it gets the lock can it actually decide which process to take from the queue and so on. Okay. That should tell you that more the number of processors, more there's going to be contention for the lock because higher the probability that two or more time slices are going to expire more or less at the same time and then CPU schedulers on those cores are going to contend for the lock. Only one of them can win. The other cores are going to be idle in the meantime because they cannot get the lock. If they cannot get the lock, they cannot get the next process to run. So nothing can happen until the lock is actually available. Okay. So if you have a very large number of uh, cores sharing a single queue, okay, the lock contention is going to prevent some of these cores from being fully utilized. So the queue has become a bottleneck for us. Okay. Very simple observation. And now that is going to be no longer the case if you have a distributed queue. In the pure one-to-one -one mapping where each core gets its own queue, there is no contention at all. Okay, you have your own queue, so you can just go and fetch the job from that queue and you are done. Okay, other cores are not going to be contending for your queue, they are only going to look at their own individual queues. Okay, so this problem is uh, no longer there of uh, contending for locks and whatnot. Is that clear? Okay, now that's just one of the many scenarios that you have to think. What are some other issues that may come up in this case? Okay, sorry. Go ahead. One queue may be empty. Okay, some queues may be empty, others are not. Somebody here was saying something. Yes. Uh, so one application may run half here and the second queue and the other half on the other one. Okay, in the first case. Okay, there are two points that were actually said here. Uh, the first one is referring to this figure, which says that uh, some of these queues may be empty or have few threads, other queues may have more. There may be imbalances across the queues. Okay. Other point being made was uh, related to that scenario where the process may first run on core 1, next time it's scheduled, it may run on core 2. Okay. That's also true why that's important, we'll come back, but let's talk about the uh, imbalance scenario first. Okay, so if you have distributed queues, it's the job of the operating system to ensure that the queues are evenly balanced. If some queues have 10 threads, other queues have 2 threads, that's going to give unfair advantage to the queue with 2 threads because those 2 threads are going to get more CPU time. Okay, because they are only 2 threads are sharing a core, so they'll each get 50% time on the CPU. In the other case, if there are 10 threads, they'll get 1 tenth of the CPU time. Okay, so queues will get 
imbalance, out of balance, because even if you start with a completely balanced system, as each thread starts doing IO, they will go out of the queue and start doing IO. So there is one pure thread there, for example. Okay. And threads come and go. New applications start up, applications end. So you, you, you essentially have to ensure, periodically you have to go and rebalance the queues. Okay. Otherwise you will get a system imbalance. Okay. Where some queues, some threads or processes in the shorter queues get more CPU time than the ones that are heavily loaded. So load balancing has to be put in place in this scenario. Okay. It's no longer a problem, uh, not a problem in a single centralized queue because there's only one queue. Anytime any core becomes idle, you just take the next job. There's a standard problem in queuing system. Okay. If you go to a bank or any place where there is one queue versus multiple queues, you see the same problem. You always seem to be in the slowest queue. Okay. You see that other queues are moving faster. But if there's one queue and all the there's a bunch of tellers and they are just servicing one queue, it doesn't matter. If there's one teller working faster than the other, the queue as a whole starts moving faster. Okay, same idea. Okay, so imbalance is an issue. Good lock contention is an issue. Okay, the last point that was made was uh, if you have centralized queue, the process may run on one core. Next time it runs on some other core. Okay, true. Okay, why does that impact? Anything? Okay. Is there a problem with that? Yes. Okay. So this is basically so performance was what the point is being made, and this has to essentially do with caches. And this is what I was mentioning. So why caches are important? Okay. So if you have a process or a thread that ran on a core. Okay. When it runs, it's going to fetch data and instructions from main memory. That data and instruction is going to sit in L1, L2, or L3 caches. Okay. And these caches help the performance of the application because you don't have to go to memory. Caches are much faster than RAM. Okay. So if your data and instruction is in the cache, your process is going to run faster. You don't have to fetch it from a slower uh, device, which is in this case main memory. So let's say you run for a time slice, you fetch some data and uh, instructions and it's sitting in the L1 or L2 cache of the core that you ran on. Okay. And now in a centralized queue, you go back to the end of the run queue. Next time you are going to run, there's no guarantee you're going to run on that C core. Okay. Whichever core becomes idle when you're at the head of the queue is going to get uh, that thread or process. Okay. So it is highly likely next time you run, you're going to go on to another core. When you do that, you are ending. You are starting with a cold cache. There is nothing cached. Whatever was cached was on the core that you ran previously. This core has no access to those caches. Okay. So you start with a cold cache. You will start with lots of cache misses. That is going to cause a performance slowdown. By the end of the time slice, your caches are warmed up. You have fetched more data and instruction. Okay. You are ready to run at full steam. Time slice ends. You go back to the end of the queue. Next time you run, you return yet another. So every time you run on a different core, you are going to have a cold cache and then you don't have any data or instructions and you are going to see performance slow down. Okay. This can be a significant problem in multiprocessor systems. Okay. And this is why you need to respect what is called cache affinity in your CPU scheduling algorithm. Cache affinity says that once you run on a core, you have an affinity to that cache because the cache that is associated with that core has your instructions on data. Next time, if you actually run on the same core, you are going to run much faster because you will have a warm cache to begin with. You are not starting with a cold cache. You know, all the data that was there from the previous time slice, some of it may have gotten cached out by other processes, but a lot of it will be still there. Okay? So you can use that data and start running and not have as much cache misses as if you started with a cold cache. Okay? This is going to have a significant performance impact on the CPU scheduling policy. Okay. So, as you can imagine, in a distributed queue, cache affinity is not respected at all. Okay. Each time you run on whatever core is idle at that point in time. Okay. So, you will basically see significant performance impact of, because of a cold cache. Okay. But if you have a queue per core, you will have complete respect for cache affinity. Unless load the load balancer runs and moves you to a different queue. Okay, you are going to actually be running on the same core over and over again. All your caches will be wherever you left them last time, more or less. 
and you will not have this problem. So most CPU schedulers in the multiprocessor world, because cache affinity is so important to the performance of the process, are not going to use that uh, scenario of a single uh, single uh, centralized queue. They will all trend towards being distributed. Okay. In fact, one queue per core is common in this scenario simply because performance is, uh, in this case, rules. You do not want to impact performance. You would rather have the additional complexity of occasionally doing load balancing across queues and all of that. Okay. So that is the criteria that actually dictates design. Lock contention is important, okay, but not as important as if I really start running and my performance takes a hit every time I run in my time slice because it goes on to a different core. That is not acceptable to users. So this is why, uh, although these are indeed two design choices, by and large, using a uh, distributed queue almost always seems to be a design choice that system designers make. Okay? So those are very important things to keep in mind. Now there's a whole class of multiprocessor CPU scheduling algorithm. I only described concepts here. I didn't say what CPU scheduler you pick. Okay, you can do round robin. You can do variety of different things that we talked about last time. Yeah, many of them will apply in the multiprocessor world. I'm not going to go into those. Instead, I'll spend at least a slide uh, talking about uh, parallel applications and some very specific schedulers for parallel application. So there's one more point I did want to make before I move on to the parallel schedulers, which is uh, the time slices that you see on uh, multiprocessor systems are typically larger. The quantum durations are larger than uniprocessors simply because of all of these additional issues that you have to deal with. There may be lock contention sometimes, there may be uh, warm caches that you have to deal with, that are, uh, there are more threads and so on. So to amortize the cost of higher lock contentions and more uh, cache misses and whatnot that may occur occasionally, we just have long, longer time slices so that you can amortize these overheads or larger time slices. Quantex switch overheads are a tax that you have to pay. Okay, nothing useful is happening when you're switching from one thread to another. Okay, only when a thread or a process runs is the CPU being used. If the OS is running, it's do just doing bookkeeping or scheduling, not actually doing useful work from the application's perspective. So larger time slices are typically more common than a uniprocessor world and multiprocessor system. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about parallel application. So there are again variety of schedulers that are used in this world. Uh, the one scheduler that I'm going to briefly mention is what is called gang scheduling. Okay, what gang scheduling means is you have a parallel application. It doesn't matter whether it's multiple threads or multiple processes. Let's just say the parallel application has 10 processes. Okay, and there are 10 processors. In a gang scheduling scenario, what happens is uh, the scheduler always picks all the components of the application and then runs them on all the cores at the same time. Okay, so you basically take a group and you schedule the entire group on all the cores. Okay. Rather than each core making independent decisions of which thread to run, you make a global decision saying, here is an application. I'm going to run all the threads or all the processes of the application on all the cores I have all at once. The reason this actually makes sense is when you have parallel applications uh, that communicate frequently, okay, they may use specialized libraries like MPI, if you've heard of these kinds of libraries. Okay, it is often desirable that all the components run so that they can communicate with each other and continue to make process. Progress. If you basically schedule them all independently, what happens is component I of an application may send a message to component J. Okay? Then it blocks because it has to wait for a reply. And the component J may not be running when it sends the message. You have to wait for component J to be scheduled. When it schedules, it will process the message, send back a reply. Okay, now the reply has come, but I may have gotten uh, time of context switched out. You have to wait for I to run again. Okay? So coordination between process, uh, components becomes much harder when they are scheduled independently. So what gang scheduling algorithms do is they simply take all the components of the application schedule them as a group. So think of this as group scheduling. As you look, and this allows if all of them are running and they're sending messages back and forth, you the waiting that you have to incur is much less. 
in this case. Okay, that's important from an end completion perspective. The more you wait, the longer it will take for your application to finish in general. Okay. So these kinds of scenarios are common when you have scientific applications where the application is partitioned into lots of small pieces, they're parallel, you run, run all of them, actually run them in parallel as a group. You coordinate the scheduling of components of an application across processors. Okay. So that's referred to as gang scheduling. Now, uh, although that's an int uh, interesting thing, there are many design choices you have to make. Okay? One design choice is if you ran n uh, components of a processor on n threads, one of them blocked, what would you do? Should you continue to run the others or should you block them all? Okay, so this is basically, if you block them all, even though they are runnable, then the whole process stops making progress. You continue to run then that one core is sitting there idle because you are doing gang scheduling. You can't just run some fraction of some other application. Whole application runs or nothing runs. So that's a design choice you have to make. And the answer depends on the specific gang scheduling policy. It is not one algorithm. There's a class. They're all referred to as gang schedulers. Okay. Same thing is true uh, when you are basically block on a lock. That's what the spin lock thing says. If instead of doing I.O., you basically block trying to acquire some synchronization primitive. What should you do? Okay. Should you do busy wait or should you block the whole application? Okay. So all of these, when you have this group scheduling, are important design choices to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, in some sense, you can allow the application to specify what is to be done. Because the CPU scheduler won't know what is the right thing. Okay. So you can allow application designers to say, if gang scheduling is used and some of the components block should the rest of the application run should you unblock all of them and then only when they're all ready to run again should you schedule them provide some control to the design designer may know what is right for their application so that's one strategy but there are many other strategies as well that basically are used in this one okay so this is just a flavor of very specialized cpu schedulers that are used in specifically for parallel application. They don't make any sense for general purpose operating system. If you have two cores on your laptop, you are not going to use gang scheduling. You are simply going to use some standard schedulers that we have talked about with a distributed run queue. And each process thread is going to run independently. Yeah, but in, in certain scenarios, you have to coordinate the scheduling across CPUs or across cores. And that is important when you have parallel applications. Is that clear? Any questions on this? So that's all we have for multi-processor scheduling. Now we are going to take the next step and look at distributed scheduling. Okay. So we are making progress. We started from uniprocessor single core, then we talked about multi-threaded process, uh, multi-threaded applications being scheduled on one core. We talked about multi-processors multiple processors or cores. Now you are going to talk about scheduling across multiple machines. Okay, that's distributed scheduling. Okay. So here is the scenario that we will keep in mind for distributed scheduling. We'll assume that there are n machines. Okay. They could be n workstations, n servers. It actually doesn't matter okay, what the machines are. There are n machines and then there are jobs coming into the system. I'm going to use the term job to refer to any arbitrary application, process, okay, or threat. The jobs are coming into the system. And the question is, how should you go about scheduling them? Okay. The standard approach is that one machine doesn't coordinate its scheduling with other machines. Okay. When you submit a start application on machine one, the CPU scheduler just executes that application on that machine. It doesn't look at what's happening on other machine. It doesn't coordinate with other machines. So that's local scheduling. Each OS makes its own local choices. It doesn't actually talk to other operating systems or kernels running on other machines. Okay, the question we are going to ask, is there any benefit for a CPU scheduler on one machine to talk to CPU schedulers on other machines and somehow coordinate how jobs are being scheduled? Under what scenario does this make sense? And should it actually be employed in certain scenarios? That is the question we are going to answer as part of this discussion. Okay. So uh, there, there are lots of people who model what happens in this kind of distributed scheduling world. 
uh, here is a, uh, a chart that I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Okay? And this chart is basically showing an answer to this question, and this question is actually important to the problem of distributed scheduling. The question is the following. What is the probability that a given machine is idle? Okay? And then there is also a job that is waiting to be scheduled in the system. Okay? What's the probability that both of these events are going to be true at the same time? Okay. The events are, at least one machine is idle, others may be busy and there's at least one job in the system that's waiting for service. Okay, that's not actually executing and waiting to okay. And we'll talk about this now. And uh, this is basically going to show you a curve where x-axis, which is not labeled here, is actually load on the system. The load can vary from 0 to 1. 1 means all machines are 100% saturated. 0 means all machines are idle. Okay, 0.5 means on an average, the utilization of a machine is 50%. Not that every machine is 50%, but the global utilization is 50%. Okay? And the y-axis okay, is showing you the probability that both of those two events are true at a given load. Okay? So basically, y-axis is the probability that these two conditions are both happening in the probability of, uh, of both those events occurring simultaneously. x-axis is the load. You will see that the probability goes up and comes down again, and we'll see why that is the case. Okay, but let's analyze the scenario a little bit. Okay, we can take two scenarios first. Let's take the lightly loaded case. Okay, on the average load in the system is low. Okay, it's lightly loaded machines. Okay, so in this scenario, if I ask you, what is the probability that a system is idle? Okay, what would you say? Is it high or low? It should be high. The system is lightly loaded. Okay. That basically means many machines must be sitting there idle or a very little load. Okay. So the probability that any given machine is idle is going to be high in this case. Okay. Now if I also say if the system is lightly loaded, what's the probability that there's a job waiting for service because it's not able to run on the CPU. The CPU is actually busy. What's that probability? Is it high or low? Okay, it should be low because if a system is lightly loaded, that means most CPUs are idle. If a job comes in, it should immediately get service. It shouldn't have to wait. It only waits if there's some other job running ahead of it. Okay? So what does this tell us? Okay? When you are in a lightly loaded regime, the probability that a system is idle is high. The probability that the job has to wait when it comes in is low. You take the product of those two probabilities, you'll actually see the product is also low. And with multiplying high number by low number, you'll get a low number. Yeah, the probability of both of those two events happening is actually going to be low at the same time. Because one, although one has high probability, the probability of the other happening is not very low. So the two won't happen at the same time. Okay? Now we are going to flip the discussion. So let's look at the heavily loaded regime. Yeah. On an average, systems are heavily loaded in this case. Okay, so then if you say, what's the probability a system is actually idle in the system? Is that high or low? Okay, it should be low in this case because most machines are loaded. It's very hard to find a lightly loaded machine. Okay, and then if I ask, what is in this high heavily loaded? Or what's the probability that a job is going to have to wait when it comes in? It should be high. The systems are heavily loaded, the CPU is actually running something else on an average. So when a new job comes in, it's very likely that it will come into a system as something else is running, so it has to wait. Okay. And if you say, what is the probability both of those two events are going to occur at the same time? You should say it's low, because one is going to occur with high probability, the other is going to occur with low probability, so they're likely not to happen in the same. So that's now heavily loaded and lightly. Now you should ask, what has this got to do with scheduling at all? Yeah, so now let's think about what this has to do with distributed scheduling. So what is distributed scheduling and how does it help us? Okay. Distributed scheduling simply says, just as in multiprocessor scheduling, occasionally when there are imbalances on one core, you could move the thread to another, another core. In a distributed scheduling world, we are going to look at all the machines. We are going to look at the load on those machines. If some machines are lightly loaded, some are heavily loaded, 
the heavily loaded machine will offload their job to lightly loaded. Say, I have a job, I have too many jobs, take some of my work and you just send it off to some other machine, it gets scheduled on that machine. That is basically distributed scheduling. Okay, so you are essentially, your schedulers are co cooperating with each other. If one gets more loaded than the other, it offloads some tasks to other machines. Okay, so you no longer just schedule locally, you schedule in a distributed scenario. Okay, that is what distributed scheduling is. Now you can say, what does this have to do with the question we asked? That question is actually critical to answering whether distributed scheduling is actually going to buy you anything. So you should ask, under what scenario does it make sense for one machine to start offloading jobs to other machines and the system as a whole benefits? Okay. So this is where this question comes into play. Let's take a lightly loaded scenario. Okay. In a lightly loaded scenario, most machines are idle. Okay. And then he said, what is the probability of a job waiting? Distributed scheduling will only help you if the job comes into the system, it finds that there is some other job sitting there, the scheduler says, okay, you go run somewhere else. Okay, then you find some other idle machine and run it. Okay, but in a lightly loaded world, it's unlikely that there is going to be any waiting job at all. Job comes in, CPU idle, it just starts running. So there is nothing to move around because most jobs are happy. Okay, they basically get to run on the CPU, there are no waiting jobs. There are no waiting jobs, there's nothing to send to any other machines. Okay, so not, you're not going to get anything from doing distributed scheduling. Okay, if there's nothing to send, what, what are you going to schedule on any other machine? Not much. Okay. Now you go to heavily loaded regime. Okay, there are lots of jobs waiting. Every machine has plenty of jobs to run. Okay, so distributed scheduling should help you. Okay, but it can't. Because there's no machine to send these jobs to every job is sitting on a machine that's heavily loaded, it will only help if there are lightly loaded machines to take on these jobs. Okay, so it does look like you can actually send this job somewhere if you could find those machines, but those machines are not to be found. Okay. So even if you implement a distributed scheduler, it's not going to buy anything at all because there is nothing to you can do in this case. There are no idle resources in the system. So I just argued that in a lightly loaded scenario, distributed scheduling has nothing to do. And in a heavily loaded dist scenario, distributed scheduling cannot do anything, even if there's plenty to do. Okay. So in either of these two scenarios, you can't actually, even if you implement anything like this, is not going to get you anything in terms of improving your overall performance. Okay. So then you should say, okay, then why do you even bother? If system lightly loaded can't do and nothing to do. Heavily loaded cannot do anything. Okay, so is there any scenario where I can even use anything like this? Okay. So it does turn out that only in the middle can you actually use this. Okay, this is why the probability rises and falls. Okay, in the middle case, when you are moderately utilized, okay, you will have some machines that are lightly loaded, some machines that are heavily loaded. On the average, the load is in the middle. And at the same time, when a job comes in, if it lands up on a heavily loaded machine, it will have to wait. Okay, and there may be an opportunity for it to move to a lightly loaded machine and actually run instead of waiting on that machine. Okay, so if you implement distributed scheduling in any system, you have to be clear that it has only limited utility when the utilization of your system is somewhere in the middle. If you are lightly loaded system, your CPU scheduler is not going to get you much, neither if you are in the heavily loaded regime. Okay? But that doesn't mean distributed scheduling is useless, there is nothing you can do with it. If you are somewhere in the middle, you can actually do something. Because the probability both of those events are true will actually start rising. And when the, both of those events are true, distributed scheduling can buy you something. Because there is a job waiting, it can be moved to another machine and there is a system idle that machine can actually accept jobs. Is that clear? So distributed scheduling is going to be useful only when those two events are true. And we just argued that that is going to be only true when you are in moderate utilization system, not in the other two cases. Okay, so that's so you will see that there is some utility, but it is somewhat limited. In other two scenarios, you're better off doing local scheduling. Okay. OS does its own thing, doesn't move jobs around. 
any questions on this before we move on to actually looking at policies of how to go about doing this. This is just arguing, does this make sense? You're adding complexity. You're moving jobs across machines that comes at a cost. Okay, so you better know that is going to buy you something before you do anything. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, so this is exactly what I was just discussing, saying high utilization, little benefit, low utilization, no job waiting. Okay, so only potentially useful during moderate utilization. So then you have to ask the question, how do you go about implementing these policies? And that's what we are going to look at. We need to figure out what load means. Okay, I just said heavily loaded, lightly loaded. I sort of hand waved uh, and then didn't actually define any of these things. So what does load mean? How do we decide? when to move a job, who gets to get take a take on a job. That is what we are going to now discuss. Okay, so there will be many design issues to look at. Okay, I'm going to define them, but we'll take a very simple cut at the approach. Okay. Measure of load for us is going to be Q length. Okay. How many jobs are waiting? What is the length of my run queue? Okay, run queue is basically all the uh, jobs that are waiting to run on the CPU schedule. Okay, what is actually running is runnable. Okay, that's the, so that's what we are going to use as a simple measure of load. There could be other measures, CPU utilization and whatnot, but we can simply take a look at the Q length as our measure. It's a simple enough measure. Okay. There will be many different policies we can actually implement on how distributed scheduling works. You can have static policies where some decisions are hardwired into the system. You'll see dynamic policies where as the load changes, the policy may make different decisions. There may be adaptive policy where the policy itself may change. Okay. You'll see examples of all of these. Okay. The static one is of course simple. As you go down from dynamic to adaptive, the policy becomes more complex. Okay. You can have preemptive versus non-preemptive, which is jobs come in. When they move to another machine, should you preempt the job or just once it starts running, you cannot preempt it. Okay. That will again have some implication on what kind of OS support you need to implement all of this. Okay. The, policy, the decision could be centralized or decentralized. Okay? Who decides whether to move a job? Is there some centralized entity in my system that's watching all the machines and then saying, okay, that machine gets overloaded, let me move it to some other machine. Or is the policy fully distributed? Okay, each machine makes local decisions on whether it needs to offload jobs, take on jobs and so on. Okay? That's another policy uh, for the implementation uh, of the design decision. Okay, last point is where you need things to be stable. Okay, well, if you start moving jobs around, you want to make sure that jobs are not going to hop around. So you can't just offload one job from one heavily loaded machine to another heavily loaded machine and make the problem worse. Okay, if you do this, you want to have a stable regime. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that also. Okay, so we'll discuss two or three policies, before, maybe two before the class ends. And each policy has four components. There's a transfer policy of the scheduler, which is when should I transfer the process? Okay, when is it that I decide to offload some jobs to some other job? That's a transfer policy. Okay. Selection policy says, which process should I move? I have jobs in my queue. Which of those should I pick? Okay. That's what is called a selection policy. Okay. Location policy is having decided to offload some jobs, okay, where should I send it to? which machine should I send it to. Information policy says what information do I need to track to make all of those previous three decisions. Okay. And there will be many design choices for each. Okay. So for example, a transfer policy could be very simple threshold base. Okay. If utilization rises above 70 or 80 percent, declare the machine to be heavily loaded and start offloading some jobs. It could be as simple as that. So you say what is heavily loaded, I just define a cutoff. My load goes up, a local load goes above this value, okay, time to start sending jobs. Also. You can define load in terms of queue length as well. I have a length of five. If I have more than five jobs waiting, I said I'm heavily loaded, send start sending jobs. Also. Okay. Simple threshold based policies could work. Selection policy says which process should I transfer? Typically, if you have a new job that has just arrived in the system, it's easier to transfer that job than a job that has been executing. Yeah, because if you try to move a job that's executing, that requires you to migrate a process. 
migrating a process that's already running from one machine to another is a lot more complex. You have to take the process state, memory content, start moving it around. Complicated process. Okay, can be done, and I will talk about some techniques to do it, but much harder. Newly arriving job is user just typed a command. I haven't even started the process. I simply send the whole command somewhere else, run it there, send back the results. Because the process itself gets instantiated on some new machine. So there's nothing really to transfer other than simply I just started uh, the type the command and let's just send the whole thing over and started it also. So it's always easier to just transfer new processes, but if you transfer existing ones, you better have support to migrate existing processes and so on. Location policies is where to transfer it. That depends on finding your idle machine to send it to. So you have to send it to some machine that's likely loaded. How do you find the machine? You have to figure out what is the load on all the machines. You can go around polling, saying tell me your load and based on what load comes back you send. Or you can keep track of some uh, load snapshots periodically and use that to make design decisions. But there are many ways to figure out what is the load and how do you pick which machine to send. Okay, and I'm going to talk about two policies and then we will end. Okay. So the first one is what is called sender initiated policy. And as the name suggests, uh, when the machine gets heavily loaded, that machine becomes a sender machine because it's sending work elsewhere. And all of that policy runs on the sending machine. The sending machine is the one that is making all of those four design decisions we talked about. Okay. So transfer policy is very simple. You have a threshold of T. Okay, when the queue length exceeds T, I declare the machine to be a sender and it starts actively looking for places to send additional jobs. Okay, so threshold based policy for sending. Selection policy is by default, let's say we just move newly arrived processes in the queue because otherwise you have to do process migration and we haven't seen how to do that yet. Location policy is very straightforward. In this case, there are three variations. You are basically going to randomly pick okay, a machine. You don't even ask it for load. So I am heavily loaded. I toss a coin, send it to machine 10. Okay. It's a randomized policy. Okay. I can also poll and then uh, find a lightly loaded machine. Okay. So I start polling. Okay. I ask machine one, what is your load? If it's under T, Okay, I know that it's lightly loaded. Anything about T is heavily loaded. So you can say, I keep polling and once I find a lightly loaded machine, I send it to you. Okay? Or you can probe in parallel and pick the least loaded machine. I ask everyone for their load. They all send me back a reply. I pick the least loaded machine and send it to you. In the first case, I just find the first machine with load less than T and send it. In the second case, I probe everyone. I find the least loaded and then send it. So, in e so these, this is basically the uh, selection uh, policy, transfer policy and location policy. What is important is this, when the sender or the machine becomes overloaded, it is going around looking for other machines to offload its task to. That is why it's called sender initiated. Okay. So as you can imagine, the converse is a receiver initiated policy where when a machine becomes lightly loaded, it actively goes around looking for work. Okay, so it's the exact opposite. So in this case, if a process leaves that local machine and its load falls below a low threshold, then you de the machine declares itself saying, I am willing to take on work. My load is low. Okay, so it's now going to go around hunting for work. It's not waiting for it, it's actively looking for work. Okay. So you basically want to now look for work. Selection policies, you always try to get newly arrived processes because you don't have to do process migration. And the way you look for work is you again probe machines and you find one that has enough work to send you one job. Okay, so you can again go and probe in sequential, is uh, sequentially and say when, whenever you find the first machine that has a load above a high threshold, you say, okay, you seem to be heavily loaded, give me a task, but no more than one task. Okay. Or you can probe them all and find the most heavily loaded machine in the system and ask it to upload some tasks. Okay. Very straightforward, exact opposite policy, receiver initiated. So when machines become lightly loaded, they go around looking for them. Okay. Okay, you can have symmetric policies where both of these policies run in parallel. 
Okay, so essentially, uh, you have a high th threshold and low threshold. If a local load on a machine goes above the high threshold, it becomes a sender. And basically, if the load goes above a low threshold, you become a receiver. Your receivers are hunting and they can actively take on work. Senders are actively trying to offload work. So both of those can happen in parallel. There's nothing that prevents that from happening. So in this case, basically, you are going to have both running in parallel and uh, you become a sender or a receiver depending on whether you're above a one high threshold or below the low threshold. Nodes in the middle are not going to do anything. They're neither senders nor receiver. They're just executing local jobs. There's nothing to send or receive for them. But uh, the other are too extreme to become a sender or a receiver. Okay. So the same kind of uh, policy is true. You have to first figure out the load on other machines if you're a sender or receiver and figure out which is a desirable machine to ask for work or send work. Okay. So just the two policies are implemented in the same system okay. just to make it more effective to offload or take on work. Okay. And the reason you have both of them happening in parallel is under certain scenarios where there's only one uh, lightly loaded machine or one heavily loaded machine it's easier if you have both policies running in parallel so that you can quickly offload or take on. If there are lots of senders or lots of receivers, you can pick one or the other, it's going to be effective. But the rare choice having both of them is actually more effective. Okay. So that's a symmetric policy. And I think we have run out of time. So I have some case studies to actually show how these policies, sender initiated, receiver initiated, were implemented in real systems. Uh, although the systems are 20 years old now, more than 20 years old, it's good to go and do a case studies. But since we ran out of time, I'm going to come back to case studies uh, next time, uh, which is actually Friday, and we'll finish some of these real world examples of looking at distributed scheduling. Okay, so for today, we are done. Okay. And just a reminder if you came late, make up class on Friday in this room, same time, 9 o'clock. Okay. <coughs>